Back to Back to the Future. Uh, it's a comic book about what would happen if uh, the filmmakers accidentally went back in time and realized they still had a chance to make sure Eric Stoltz wasn't replaced by Michael J. Fox in the original Back to the Future movies. And uh, they take that chance and they play with history and then they have to sort of clean up their mess. And it started as a script, right? Yeah, it was a script that I started in 2001. Uh, it was the night before my senior thesis was due in college and I didn't have an idea to turn in. And I read an article online about how when Eric Stoltz was fired from Back to the Future, uh, there's also an actress who was collateral damage, and her name's Malora Hardin. Uh, she plays Jan on The Office, and people recognize her from some great stuff. And uh, she was then let go because she's too tall for Michael J. Fox. And I, I was reading this, and the Bob Gale who wrote and produced uh, the movies was saying it was his biggest regret in life was letting her go because she didn't merit being let go. And I thought it was really sort of interesting that the man who wrote my favorite time travel movie of all time had a major regret and I thought it would be really interesting if he could use the own device he created and go back in time and change it. And so I went into class the next day, turned it in, everyone said, well this, why would you write this? This can't be a movie. And I said, because I want to write this story, it's a fun story. And then I put it in a drawer after I graduated and then for seven years and I took it out in 08 or 09. Oh wait, and I read it with a bunch of friends because uh, sometimes we get together and we read material. And so many people were like, why don't you do something with this? And I was a good timing because I had just worked on a comic book uh, from start to finish and knew that this would be a great medium to tell a story where I wouldn't have to sacrifice any of the ideas or, or just the grand ambitions of the story because I could draw it all. And uh, so we started drawing and I found this artist who did 130 pages of cover quality art and it took him three and a half years. Yeah, so it's been a trek. But now it's out and it's going to a good cause and it's, uh, it's, it's benefiting the Young Storytellers Foundation, and uh, I'm finally getting the story out into the world. How is it working with them? Because, I mean, hopefully those kids know Back to the Future and appreciate it, but of course there's a generation gap there, so are they aware? Yeah, it's, it's one of those, those few movies that everyone I've talked to has seen it. You know, there's never really anyone, and maybe if you're at 12 and under, but, you know, there's enough of there's enough of a fan base. You just may say the word "Back to the Future" on the internet, and a million people turn their heads. And so I've been really lucky to be a part of the conversation of the films because people will then to talk about the movies based on the stories they're hearing about the comic. And back to when you handed it in yeah. in college, why did they say that you it couldn't be a movie? Like because well, of rights always, and things like yeah, that. Yeah, we just thought like, well, Back to the Future. There's probably a lot of rights issues, and and uh, I was writing, you know, Eric Stoltz as a character, and 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 Bob Gale as a character, and Melora as a character, and creating you know, an original story with, with their images and likenesses. And I wasn't sure what the law covered, and I didn't care because it was just for credit. It wasn't for commercial use. But then when I started to make the comic book and adapt it from a screenplay to a comic play, you know, panel by panel descriptions for the artists, and I started then having to look into the legality of it all. And I, you know, the guys who did Super Size Me in Room 237, you know, they chimed in and they, they, they gave me an opinion letter and got me insured and they said, you can go to town. And so, because uh, it is a parody and it's all, uh, it's all fair use and I got to sort of use my First Amendment rights. Are any of those people aware of it? Yeah, uh, I mean, I haven't heard from Eric Stoltz, I haven't heard from Bob Gale, but I've heard from other people, like Melora Hardin loves it and she was tweeting like back to back to back about it. And then a couple other people who have like cameos in the thing found it and they've been contacting me on Facebook and I've been like just very thrilled, especially from Melora because for over a decade I was like, this girl's going to think I'm the biggest creeper on earth because here I am writing a story with her as the central character and yeah, and, I was, and using her image in this art. So I was, I was nervous, but she liked it and I feel relieved. Do you know the legality behind that situation? Because I can't really imagine someone signing on for a movie and just being cut like that. I know. Well, you know, it's such a, it's, it's like Star Wars or Star Trek. It's that big, you know? It's in the zeitgeist. And when you're part of history and when the creator's talking about you, you know, you're part of the story. You're part of the chronology of everything. And and she's the one I, I felt the more nervous about just as on a personal level, not on a legal level, just because I felt like she never did get to show up to set. Eric showed up for a month, you know? Uh, I can't tell what's worse, actually. Yeah. Putting the work in. Not even getting to go in and do what you're talented enough to do, you know? And Claudia Wells, who was the girl who took over for Melora, uh, did great. But even she couldn't stay on for the sequels. Elizabeth Shue ultimately took her role over. So. Whatever happened to that original footage that uh, Eric Stoltz shot? I have a very good friend who was in my screenwriting class at Ithaca when I was writing the screenplay here about a month ago. 
called me up and said, I've seen the footage. He works at Universal. He was sat surprised in the theater and they ran the, the projector. He didn't know what he was seeing and he saw all of it. And so I'm trying to see what I can do to get into that room. <laughs> did he tell you what he thought about it? Yeah, was it really it, that bad? He said it was fascinating. You know, it's, you can just tell it's a personality thing. You know, it's like if Shia, Shia LaBeouf or Ryan Gosling are trying to do the same movie today, just two different types. You know, and uh, uh, I'm currently working on getting into that secret room without anyone knowing. Having made your own movies, can you relate at all? Like, I highly doubt you ever cut someone like that, but yeah. sometimes you got to make decisions for creative purposes. You know, uh, on Would You Rather, uh, we had Crispin Glover up until a week before shooting, and we let him go because it wasn't working, which is another piece of Back to the Future trivia. He was let go from the sequels because he's been difficult, and uh, and I was in a similar situation I guess Omekas was in. Uh, but. It worked out for the best because Jeffrey Combs is the best thing that's ever happened to the movie. So Jeffrey Combs, I thank Chris McGlover for being difficult because then the movie would not have been as good as it is, you know? With how that movie end, ended, would you ever consider going around for another go? Oh, I would totally do more uh, Would You Rathers. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd make a sequel. Stefan and I, who's the writer, uh, and I are trying to think of creative ways to, to advance the sort of the universe. We don't want to do another sit around a table and play a game. We want to take Woody Rather to another level, find a way to just open it up, get them out of a house, and uh, it would definitely be Shepard Lambert would have to stay in it. But uh, we want to, like I was thinking it would be funny if like a bunch of Britney Snow fans were traumatized and they were going to support group and then they were forced into a game of Woody Rather. But then he thought, you know, and he's right, it's really close to what Human Centipede 2 did. When they, there was a guy who, I think the, the, the premise was a guy liked the movie so much he started copycatting. So we're just trying to think of something creative and, and off the off the path of what we started. It kind of makes me think of what you would need to do or why this story would have made such a good movie because we've seen so many so many sequels and reboots that kind of just repeat things. Yeah, and we felt like we were making a movie that could easily have been repeating what other movies have been doing. You know, we were in a you know make a tough choice or movie territory. And we wanted to still try to be unique, even though we were in that territory. And we want to continue that if we do more. You know, we don't want to just like then fall into the cookie cutter machine. We want to continue to be a little different. And we 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 feel like we made mistakes, and we can do stronger work in the future, and we will. So I feel like if we do more, each one will get better and better. And what about with something like Back to Back to Back to the Future? Yeah. Can you say that? Back to Probably Back to like the Future. Probably five times fast. Back to Back to the Future. Back to Back to the Future. Back to Back to the Future. Back to Back I'm to impressed. the Future. I'm impressed. It's your work. You should be able to do it. Yeah. All people have to do is go to GivingBackToTheFuture.com. <laughs> That's perfect plug. Yeah. But. Like, why not make that a movie if it takes off? Because it's I would a totally do it. Um, way. And I was, you know, it's funny because the story's there now and people can see the potential. They can see the art. They can see... I basically storyboarded out the movie, you know? I rushed some of the moments in the screenplay just because we have page limits, you know? So, like, scenes where I could have taken ten pages were on two. But, you know, it's all there. It's beautiful. And people have been talking to me saying, hey, if they want to make a movie, would you? Yeah, of course. Why wouldn't I? But uh, I'm happy if it's a comic because the story is still out there and people are talking about it and my story is no longer in a drawer.